Music of our guest, Grammy-winning blues guitarist and singer John Hammond, long regarded as one of the most important acoustic blues artists in the world. Nice to have you here, John. Nice to be here. Thanks, Dan. Your latest album is called Got Love If You Want It. Yep. You went a long time without an album. Uh, what was going on? Well, actually, I didn't go a long time without an That's album. That's what I meant I was to say. With <laughs> <laughs> I was without a, a major label. I was with uh, Rounder Records, mm -hmm. and I was with Flying Fish. Mm -hmm and uh, with Vanguard, uh, not big labels, but when I signed with uh, Point Blank Virgin mm -hmm. Charisma, uh, it was back in the big time. Yeah. I guess, uh, What's the difference in, in recording for one of the smaller labels and a big one? Um, as far as you're concerned, do you feel any difference at all? Not, not at all. Uh, when I go in to record, it's, you know, the microphones and uh, my instruments and myself and uh, in terms of what's done after it's recorded, that's the big difference where uh, a small la la label will say thanks very much and mm -hmm. eventually it's released and maybe it gets into the stores and maybe it doesn't. You hope for word of mouth. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> or what they, what they often do is they say, well, we'll sell you your, your album at a very cheap price so, so that you can haul them all over the United States or wherever and sell them out of the back of your car. How many albums have you done total? Uh, 25 or 26. Yeah. And you just taped, from what I understand, maybe yesterday, American Music Show. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Network, which is a great show. Yes, I I've, I've came to find that out. They do that. They used to do that at Vanderbilt. They don't do it at Vanderbilt anymore. They do it out of the Opryland Park now. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And, which is closed for the sea season, so it's like... Uh, walking through a stage set. <laughs> yeah, it really is at yeah. this time of year. It's just deserted, deserted paths and, and, and roads. He worked with Mark O'Connor, who I yes. think is just a wonderful He musician. is. He's fantastic. And Jerry Douglas and mm -hmm. Glenn and all the guys were there. It was like who's who in the uh, uh, studio set. Yeah. Kind of Interesting to me that you, a, a well-to-do white kid grows up in New York City. This is you. And, and it's interesting that you should become so deeply and intensely involved with blues music and become such a, a, a major force in it. Take us back to uh, when you were a kid and, and all the other kids are listening, or maybe you are too, to Johnny Mathis and to Elvis and to Rick Nelson. And How did you hook up with blues music? Well, um, I don't, f I would like to say that a, a well-to-do, I don't know, um, I, I grew up in a uh, in Greenwich Village in New York uh, in the, uh, the 1940s. Um, I went to uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse, which was uh, known as the Commie School uh, in the village. Um, my music te te teacher of the school was black. She, uh, her name was Charity Bailey. She sang a lot of Lead Belly songs and got all the kids to sing. Um, I learned a lot about, you know, folk blues at that tender age of five years old. And wow. Everybody, um, I mean, her, every year you, you would have her as the music te teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, every child had to play some kind of instrument, whether it be a tambourine or a, a, a Chinese gong or, uh, or whatever. Um, I, I, I never got into playing an I instrument, but I, I learned to sing. Mm -hmm. And the songs that I learned were, you know, the folk blues style. Um, what was your teacher's name? Charity Bailey. Yeah. She was wonderful. She played the guitar and the piano. Do you yeah. credit her in some ways with, with, with all of this? That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I'm yeah. saying this is how I got into knowing about blues at an early age. Um, my, my father was a well-known producer of jazz and uh, later on folk and yeah. uh, rock and roll. A some big blues. force in the music industry. Right. I did not grow up with him. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was five, and so I lived in the village with uh, my mom and my mm -hmm. brother Jason. 
When was the last time you ran across Charity? Uh, I believe she died a few e e years ago. I saw her about 15 years ago um, in New York, and mm -hmm. um, she was wonderful. She was a terrific. Did person. did she know? Did you tell her the impact she had on your music and yes, your life? Yes, I did. So she was aware of that, and she saw your success. Well, she it? saw some some of it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read where you, as a kid, would listen to WLAC, and we've talked That's on this. Right. We talked on this program many times. In fact, we we've had uh, Hoss Allen on this show talking oh. about the old days of music. Oh, God. That have an impact on you? A big time. Yeah. Big time. Uh, late at night, I would uh, have uh, the radio uh, hidden well away, and. John R. and Big Hugh and mm -hmm. all the guys. Hugh Baby, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I listened. I know all about Royal Crown, Petroleum Jelly, mm -hmm. and the all, baby all its uses. <laughs> <laughs> that we can't talk about. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, no, this was where I cut my teeth. This is where I got hip to Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters mm -hmm. and Little Walter and all the Chicago style yeah. movies. And they didn't play any of this on the New York stations or the stations up in that area? In the, in the middle 50s, I listened to uh, the Alan Freed show. Uh, Alan Freed was a great DJ who was completely colorblind. Uh, he not only had a radio show, but he produced these um, rock and roll concerts in New York and Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. uh, he put on shows that would have artists like Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, um, just about everybody. Jerry Lee Lewis, mm -hmm. um, Joanne Campbell, the blonde bombshell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of these great um, uh, doo-wop bands, uh, uh, the Cadillacs, uh, the Drifters, the Eldorados. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great. Uh, New York lost a, a great guy when, when he was f forced off the air and, uh, and died of it um, not long after. You're right. He was colorblind years before it was right. acceptable to be right. colorblind in, in, in the world of music and brought many acts together That's exactly that, that right. in other places and other forms in many cases could not exactly. perform together yeah. uh did you and you so you went to see a lot of these people perform up there. all the time yeah yeah he was uh you know uh of, of force, as I say. Yeah. Tell me about Howlin' Wolf. Now, Howlin' Wolf is, 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 if you, I used to listen to Howlin' Wolf on WLAC late at night also. You met this guy. I worked many shows with him. Uh, Chester Burnett. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Recall for us your first meeting with him. Uh, I met him in Los Angeles, 1965, at uh, the Ash Grove. This is a club where, uh, perhaps the greatest club that I ever pl played at. Um, I, I opened the show and I played my set, which included a lot of uh, Robert Johnson songs. Mm -hmm. um, I came back um, to the backstage area and there was this giant of a man and he's looking at me so intensely and he says, how come you can play that stuff? <laughs> and I said, I felt like, you know, I wanted to run away, yeah. you know, but I couldn't and I said, uh, I learned it off the records, and he said, me too. And he said, give me that guitar. And he played me um, uh, Charlie Patton uh, Stone Pony Blues on my guitar. And I, I didn't know that he even played the guitar. Uh, I, I thought he was ju just the, uh, the harmonica, harmonica player. Sure, right? yeah. Okay, so he plays the guitar. And not only that, at the end, he spins the guitar so it spins three times and hits the last three notes. <laughs> I was just like awed huge man, beautifully uh, accomplished guitar player, great harmonica player, outrageous. And he said, you know, when I learned to play, Charlie Patton ta taught me how to play. And he said, I bet you didn't know that Charlie Patton was an Indian. I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, yep, he's about five foot five. And if I made a mistake, he'd whoop me upside the head. Mm. Imagine anybody whooping Howling Wolf upside the head. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. And I, he and I became really good friends, and I worked many shows with mm -hmm. him. He was a fantastic guy, great player. Yeah. Not yeah. the nicest guy to other folks. I, I, I was very happy that he was nice to me. It's often sad that so many of these great blues players didn't get the mainstream acceptance that they so often uh, yeah. deserve. Let me take a break. John Hammond is our guest. We'll be right back, and uh, John's going to perform something for us. Stay with us. Hands 
on her hips And these are the words she said She said, big boy, I wouldn't miss you If the good Lord told me you were dead From Austin City Limits, our guest John Hammond. One more thing here about Howlin' Wolf we're talking about, and I, and I hope people know who we're talking about. Yeah. He did have an inspiration that came from country music. Didn't yes, he? he did. Jimmy Rogers. Yeah. He told, told me he wanted more than anything in the world to be able to yodel and to sing, you know, those kind of blues. And uh, he couldn't yodel, so he got his howl to get together, and uh, and he learned to play from from Charlie Patton. So that howl is a, is a derivative from the desire to do a yodel. That's right. It also song. shows that, that blues and country are almost, you know, hand in glove. They all came from the same source. Tradition. Yeah. 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 Folk music. Uh, what are you going to do for us here, John? Uh, I could do a Robert Johnson song. Great. Great. Here's John Hammond. She's the only thing this world for me. So I get a kind hearted woman. Man, she's the only thing this world for me. But you know these evil hearted women, who Lord, this shovel will leave me be. You know I love my baby. Don't love me. Would I love my baby? Would I swear my baby don't love me? And I really love that woman. Man, I can't stand to leave. I said in but one thing. Really makes your daddy drink. I get worried how you treat me, baby. And I begin to say, Oh, baby, my life don't seem the same. You broke my heart when you called Mr. So and so. Robert Johnson, right? Yes. You narrated a special, a British TV special about uh, Robert Johnson. Yes, I did. Uh, recently. What was, what was it about this guy that had such an impact on you and on so many people who perform blues music? To me, he was like the synthesis of the blues artists of his era. He could play 
in the style of uh, artists like Lonnie Johnson, uh, Willie McTell, Blind Boy Fuller. He had all of that in him, um, and yet he came out with his own sound, his own songs, his own lyrics, and uh, his guitar technique was just unbelievable. He was a phenomenal player. How do people accomplish that in, in such a few years? I mean, he was like in his late 20s or mid-20s. Late, late, well, he, he died when he was 27. 27 years but old. But he had been playing for professionally for 10 years, so mm -hmm. he, he'd been out there. I don't know how pe people learned to play. I, I started playing professionally a year and a half after I started playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. I can't explain that. It can, so it came easy to you? It did, yeah. You taught yourself? Yes. I, but I knew all the words of the songs. I knew all the songs, so it was just a matter of putting enough guitar to to uh, the songs that I already mm. knew. But, but some people, can, you, can, you can, can pick up an instrument and they have, there's something there, there's a gift we don't understand. I don't understand You can, you can comprehend yeah. the guitar. You, you use acoustic guitar, uh, you don't wire it. I don't know enough about the right. technical terms I, to... I, I, I do not uh, have a direct box, I, I just play it into the microphone, so mm -hmm. it's acoustic, unplugged. <laughs> yeah. you ne you, so you don't you ever use the electrical? I, I'll play an electric guitar if I'm playing with a band, mm -hmm. but that's very rare these days. How about when you play a huge arena, a huge outdoor arena? Mm -hmm. Is it a difficult task to mic an acoustic guitar? Not, not if the sound man knows how to do it. Um, it's it's as easy as it can be. You, mm -hmm. you stick the microphone in front of the hole of the guitar <laughs> and it makes sound and it picks it up. Uh, some, some sound technicians just are not familiar with acu acoustic instruments. Mm -hmm. They're used to it, everything being wired through, through, through the board, mm -hmm. so uh, to them it's hard, but anyone who knows how to do it can do it. What type guitar do you you, is there one type you work with? Or well, I, I just received in the last six months a guitar made by a guy named Vin Smith in England. He made it. It's made of uh, koa wood. It's styled after a, a, a tri triple O Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fantastic guitar. Uh, the the name of the guitar is a, a, a David R. Stubbs. How long do you play one guitar? Do you go through a lot, or do you keep one for the, the well, they, they run for the whole career? I don't know the lifespan of a guitar. A, gu a good guitar will last you a lifetime. Uh, a handmade guitar, is unless it has a, a bad fall, will last for, for a long time. Here's the most recent album from John Hammond, Got Love If You Want It. Good luck with the album. Thanks, John, for coming here. Boy, you make great music. Well, thank you. Appreciate it meeting you and, and spending some time with you. Great. John Hammond, our guest here. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Dan Baird. Don't go away. <laughs>